When we think of Africa, the image that often comes to mind is one of poor starving children or of a place rich in raw natural resources that can be exploited. But they provide a very incomplete picture of Africa. This is the new face of the 21st century farmer. The clothes that you're wearing today, it's cotton that has been farmed by the farmer. The shoes that you're wearing, that's leather that comes from the cows that your farmer has. It's been 200 years since the United States opened its first consulate in Sub-Saharan Africa. Throughout the history of Africa's tribes and kingdoms, there is also a common and recurring theme of female warriors who exhibited a sense of collectiveness and intense militarism. Africa's first spaceport opened in 1964 near Malindi, Kenya. In 1970, the first satellite specifically for X-ray astronomy, Uhuru, was launched from Kenya. Why Codewiz? How did it come about? I've always had a passion for working with kids and I've always had a passion for business. Harvard's Global Health Catalyst Program, which was started by my guest, Dr. Wilfred Ngoa, to bridge the healthcare gap in low and middle income countries. Welcome to Africa to You. I'm Vivian Kopsinger Birchall, your host, and my guest is His Excellency uh, Ambassador Carlos Dos Santos, the Ambassador of Mozambique to the United States. Welcome to the show, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Vivian. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure hosting you. So, how long have you served in the diplomatic corps and specifically in this position, and what is your role? Well, um, I am a career diplomat, so I've been in the diplomatic service of uh, Mozambique for uh, more than 30 years, and uh, I have been in the United States this time uh, since 2015, so five and a half years. Uh, I also was in New York previously from 96 to 2002, so I was... I've been in the United States for six years before this. Well, um, it is Black History Month, obviously, February in the United States. So what does this month mean to you as an African ambassador to the United States? Uh, you know, uh, I believe this is a special moment uh, for all Black people in the United States but also on the continent of Africa and around the world, because we all know that the origin of Black people is the African continent. Mm -hmm. So for me as an African uh, ambassador here, it, it is uh, a very special moment of reflection about the past, the present and the future of the continent. Uh, and we have to think about what we do and what we can do uh, and learning from past, the past, what we have done, uh, to see how best we can improve our contribution to this country, to the continent of Africa and to Blacks everywhere. Uh, so let, let's get into a bit of history. What historical events connect Mozambique to American history? Well, uh, uh, there may be a number of things that connect uh, uh, Mozambique to the United States, um, and historians will probably have tons of them. But the ones that come to mind are two. One, way back uh, uh, in uh, 19, uh, oh, 1794, I should say, um, there was this shipwreck, which was just discovered in 2010 um, in, the in the South African waters. Uh, it is uh, a ship that was bringing 400 slaves from, uh, it was a Portuguese uh, slave trader ship, and it was bringing slaves to the continent of the Americas. It is said it was probably to Brazil 
but uh, that shows that there have been slave trade contacts between Mozambique and this region of the world. Uh, that ship didn't reach destination because it, it sunk in the waters of South Africa. And the important thing about this and the connection to the United States is that some of the evidence collected by uh, American and African researchers, some of that evidence is now at the museum, a Simpsonian Museum of uh, African American History and Culture. And it's there for everyone to see this connection uh, between uh, Mozambique and Africa as a whole and the United States. I also know that uh, uh, on the side of Angolans, for instance, even today you find Angolan families here or descendants of Angolans uh, here. And they, they came to, to the United States during the slave trade and they still have those connections. I have not yet found Mozambicans with that kind of connection, but we, we know that there, there was a connection. The second one has to do with um, the uh, man who uh, is part of the history of creating a Mozambican nation, uh, an independent country, uh, and that is Eduardo Mondlane. He uh, came to the United States to study, uh, I believe, political science and anthropology uh, at Oberlin College, Northwestern University, and when he got his PhD, he then went on to teach at Syracuse uh, University. And uh, he then joined the United Nations uh, as an international um, uh, worker there. And uh, he was working on decolonization. Uh, and he also learned about what was going and he was already conscious of what he wanted to do because uh, many years later, he returned to Africa directly to Tanzania, where three movements uh, of, uh, from Mozambique were trying to uh, liberate Mozambique from Portuguese colonialism. He was the one who joined these three movements and formed what is until today known as Frelimo, which stands for Liberation Front for Mozambique. Uh, and Frelimo uh, fought for independence uh, and we got independence in 1975. Uh, it was uh, through his leadership and his uh, capacity to unite that uh, we were able to uh, have that uh, liberation struggle uh, supported by the international community, by Africa. And he married an American uh, lady who is uh, still alive in Mozambique. Uh, he passed on uh, during the liberation struggle in 1969, but uh, she lives on and three of his children are in Mozambique. One of them, uh, a lady, is a minister in government for gender and social affairs. Another one, the, another lady is uh, um, a musician. Uh, she's in the art, uh, arts and she sings jazz as well because she lived here for many years and she studied at the same university as her father at Oberlin College. Um, and then uh, the, the first born is a son uh, who is called Eduardo Mondlani Jr. Uh, he is a businessman. Uh, and he is working in the uh, oil and gas sector and uh, high finance. And he, he lives in Mozambique and, uh, uh, and London. Uh, so they, they continue to be involved. So this is a very strong link that uh, was created then by history. And uh, of course, now we have a different kind of relationship that we can talk about. Do you want to speak to that? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we, uh, the United States and Mozambique established diplomatic relations uh, uh, in 1975, uh, the year of independence from Portugal. Yep. And uh, it started uh, as a, a, a basic cooperation, diplomatic cooperation uh, with humanitarian, a, a strong humanitarian emphasis. Uh, but uh, a few years later, 
um, this uh, was transformed into a full, full-fledged uh, development cooperation uh, with uh, very significant amounts of uh, funding from the United States, such that today the United States is the single largest bilateral donor uh, for Mozambique uh, uh, development programs, uh, about $400 million dollars a year, more than that. And uh, the focus is mainly on health, but it includes other areas like uh, private sector development, uh, doing business environment, uh, creating capacities in Mozambique, agriculture and other, uh, and other areas. But uh, the relationship is also excellent at political level where we have interactions Uh, at the highest level with the presidents, the heads of state, uh, interacting uh, with, with each, each other. And at ministerial level, our parliamentarians with Congress here, we have exchanged visits uh, between the two. We are also working on uh, relations between Mozambique and specific states that uh, we find that they have comparative advantages for cooperation. Here I can mention one example, for instance, uh, Miami-Dade County, we have started a cooperation, a collaboration uh, between the two cities, Maputo City, our capital, and Miami-Dade County. And the mayor of Maputo visited Miami in December 2019, and uh, he signed an MOU with the mayor of Miami-Dade County to begin collaboration. You may ask why Miami? Uh, <laughs> because uh, Miami and Maputo share a lot uh, in common. They, they are coastal cities, they have ports, uh, international ports, um, and uh, the tourism destination, but at different levels. As you know, Miami is internationally renowned for uh, cruise ships and uh, other kind of tourism, but coastal tourism is very well developed. And Maputo wants to develop um, uh, those capacities in collaboration with Miami, but also how you manage cruise ship uh, uh, management, uh, um, how you manage uh, uh, tourism as a whole, as an enterprise and uh, using standards that uh, you find in Miami and elsewhere here in the United States. Uh, so we work with uh, different states to explore possibilities of collaboration. We also like to promote people to people uh, exchanges, academic exchanges, and uh, we, we, we have some uh, uh, good ones going on. Uh, speaking of academic exchanges, uh, we our first meeting was at a global health uh, summit. Yes, um, indeed. So, how is the how is Mozambique working with the scientists, uh, the scientific community, or research community in the United States to collaboratively? Well, uh, I, I I do remember that after uh, my visit uh, to uh, to you over there at Harvard. Uh, I did recommend that uh, uh, some form of collaboration uh, starts. So um, your delegation did go to uh, Maputo for, for the conference that happened uh, the following year and some initial discussions happened, uh, but I must confess I have not uh, uh, gotten a progress report on what has happened thus far. Uh, most probably not much because of all the other things that uh, have been happening now. Uh, even the Miami collaboration that I was talking about uh, was impacted by COVID. Uh, we were supposed to have a delegation going to Mozambique from Miami Day that it didn't go. But uh, these are collaborations that I want to continue to promote. Right. We also have one collaboration that I can mention now with Maryland University, uh, which will train uh, young women engineers uh, to perfect their capacities 
to also enable them to uh, to have uh, specialized training for the oil and gas industry. This was an initiative by one of the uh, companies that works with Mozambique in oil and gas. And they created a, a foundation called Duayen uh, out of Houston. And they have been, uh, they just started this program and they did some uh, exams and some interviews and they have uh, selected three as the first Duayans, uh, you know, Duayan Mindim. Uh, so they, they want to make them uh, these uh, wonderful uh, young women deans of their art, uh, their engineering uh, capacities. So this is something that uh, I cherish very much. I've been working with this uh, new foundation uh, to develop it. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that uh, uh, the delegation was not my delegation as they're in the capacity of uh, media. <laughs> At the summit, but uh, yes, I, I know. I know. <laughs> when I say when I say uh, uh, your delegation, I mean Harvard uh, University yeah. medical <laughs> medical yeah. school. Yes, yes. So right. uh, yeah, I I look forward. I'm still um, where I work collaboratively with them, and uh, it's an amazing uh, experience. Um, so, in what ways would you say the African diaspora has contributed to the United States? Well, um, I think uh, the, the, the African diaspora has contributed in every way you can think of. From the beginning of the building of this nation, it is true that most of them were, all of them were slaves when they came here, but uh, uh, very early on, they contributed to the building of the United States as a nation, but then uh, over the years, they have been in all areas of development, be it academic, uh, scientific, uh, medical field. Uh, I have met architects, engineers, uh, people in the most diverse uh, uh, kind of endeavor, in the arts, in the entertainment industry, in sports, you can find African diaspora there. And uh, when we talk about African diaspora, we may uh, want to have division, but if you bring African-Americans together with uh, those uh, Africans who came afterwards, those who are from the Caribbean who are also here, you will see that they have impacted the development of this country hugely. And we are not only thinking of, uh, thinking of scientists, uh, we are also thinking of uh, people working in, in, in nursing, in, uh, in other uh, areas of uh, endeavor, day-to-day -day work uh, around this country. You will find them. And I think they, they have contributed a lot and they continue to contribute. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm excited about the diaspora. You know, it's getting more and more engaged in the, in the development of uh, not just the U.S., but also the continent of Africa. You know, what advice, uh, I guess before I get into that, uh, I just wanted to mention that Massachusetts has the largest uh, population, speaking of uh, diaspora, of Cabo Verdeans outside of Cabo Verde. Uh, and in 2019, the first lady of Cabo Verde came here, here to, came here, sorry, to fundraise for Mozambique after the hurricane. So yes. what is the historical relationship if, between Cabo Verde and Mozambique? Well, a uh, very strong one. It's a historical relations that dates back to the times of Portuguese colonialism. As you know, both Mozambique and uh, Cape Verde were colonized by Portugal uh, and three other countries in Africa, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, and São Tomé and Principe. And uh, uh, the leaders that uh, fought for independence in Mozambique and Cape Verde were working together with their brothers and sisters from Angola, São Tomé and Príncipe, and Guinea-Bissau to coordinate their action to, to liberate the countries. Uh, because uh, many of them had been moving uh, around, I mean, 
many Mozambicans, many Angolans, many Cape Verdeans had been moving around, moved by the Portuguese. Uh, Cape Verdeans were good at clerical work. Uh, we had them in Mozambique uh, and Mozambicans were working in the fields, uh, in plantations and things like that. The, there was a bond that was created then among the people of Cape Verde and Mozambique. And uh, I was privileged to actually be at the event in uh, uh, 2019 uh, that the First Lady uh, of Cape Verde hosted uh, for two reasons. One, because uh, she invited me as the ambassador of Mozambique. She said, I want uh, my ambassador to be there. Uh, and uh, she says, my ambassador, because of the second reason, she was born in Mozambique. Oh. Her father is Mozambique and he was a politician and uh, uh, a lawyer. Uh, and uh, she moved to Cabo Verde because, Cabo Verde because she married uh, the, the president of Cabo Verde uh, before he became president, of course. But uh, she then became the first lady. And she was mobilizing support for the people of Baira who were victims of this devastating cyclone called Idai. And uh, it destroyed a huge part of the city. And it so happens that she was born there because the father was uh, from there and he worked there. And she wanted to give her own contribution. So she started a movement back in Cab in Cabo Verde, but then she also worked with the community over there in Boston. And uh, they organized this event, which was a fundraiser with cultural, uh, a cultural gala with Cabo Verdeans, uh, artists, musicians, uh, including one Mozambican who also lives in uh, Boston. They participated and uh, the community uh, was there. So I was uh, one ambassador and then the Cabverian ambassador here to the United States and uh, the Cabverian ambassador to the United Nations. We were three ambassadors in that, that event. It was a unique and a special event for all of us. And we appreciated the way uh, she showed such concern and using her convening power to mobilize support for Mozambique. Yeah, that was excellent. Um, so what do you say the relationship is or how are you tapping into the Mozambican diaspora to, to give back to, your, to the community or to the country, Mozambique? Well, uh, we, we work, uh, it's part of our mandate as an embassy of Mozambique to the United States to work with the Mozambican community here in the United States. And uh, that means providing consular assistance uh, whatever they need in terms of documents, uh, passports. Uh, we, we just started uh, at the end of last year to produce or, or to capture data, biometric data, to issue passports and IDs from here uh, uh, for the Mozambican community to facilitate their uh, stay here. But we also work with them and encourage them to get involved with Mozambique. Some of them do visit Mozambique regularly, others not, but they are willing to work with us to uh, develop projects of humanitarian nature, uh, philanthropic nature, but also some of them are looking at doing business back in Mozambique. We are also working with some uh, on the academic side to uh, get them involved with academic institutions in the country. So we are trying to uh, avail ourselves of this uh, high level uh, capacity that they, they have from this country. Some of them uh, have done well here and they can make a significant contribution to the country. And some of them are already doing it. And we hope this will continue. And at the level of the African Union, we work together with our brothers and sisters, the ambassadors, uh, to promote um, greater unity, greater coherence, and uh, uh, work in concert to make sure that the diaspora can be more effective. As you may know, the African Union has decided that uh, uh, diaspora is uh, a constituency of Africa, 
and the African Union should engage them, should involve them. Uh, the organization may not be optimal, but we seek to make sure that we get that involvement of the diaspora with the continent. Excellent. Um, there's the last question that is kind of, was a surprise to me. How did Swahili become one of the native languages spoken in Mozambique? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, the Swahili or Kiswahili, because I understand Swahili means uh, literally coastline or coast. Yes. Uh, and Kiswahili is the language spoken by the people who live along the coast. So it is uh, part of the Bantu languages that uh, 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 exist around the region of East Africa. And uh, Kiswahili developed, I think, uh, from the DRC and then went uh, to, from different, to different places, Kenya, Tanzania, and Northern Mozambique, which borders Tanzania. So the Makondi tribe, uh, which is the one tribe that produces sculptures with uh, um, ebony, uh, black, wood, black wood. And they actually produce this in Mozambique, but they also migrated back to Tanzania and to, uh, to Kenya, so you can find them there. These are the people who have a language similar to Kiswahili, and they speak Swahili as well. Uh, and uh, um, it so happens that uh, that part of Mozambique uh, is close to Tanzania and they speak Swahili and they have spoken uh, over the years. Our current president, uh, His Excellency Philippe Nusi, speaks uh, excellent Kiswahili because he's from that tribe, Makondi tribe, and also uh, because he lived uh, in Tanzania as uh, a son of uh, a freedom fighter. So he speaks excellent Kiswahili and I always envy him when uh, he is speaking it and uh, Tanzanians and Kenyans smile <laughs> when he's speaking. And he has very good friends and good relationships with the presidents of Kenya and Tanzania Una and other leaders. Kiswahili? Sorry? Una sema Kiswahili? Uh, no, I don't, because I'm from um, uh, southern Mozambique. Okay. Uh, and uh, Maputo province. Uh, and we speak a language called Shangan or Ronga. Uh, they are similar. They are spoken also across the border uh, in South Africa. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> if you speak Shangan, we can speak in Shangan. But, uh, <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> not say not, not, I only know Abari. <laughs> Abariaku, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. And, well, it's been a pleasure as always uh, hosting you for this Africa to You episode on Black History Month. Um, I hope that I can uh, host you again to give us updates on uh, what your embassy is doing and also about what's going on on the continent of Africa. Like you said, um, we need to find our venues of uh, letting um, the diaspora know what's happening, so. Yes, um, yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Vivian, for having me and I'll always be available to speak with you uh, whenever you, f you deem it fit. Uh, and thank you again for having me. If you have any questions about Africa or you want to be a guest on Africa to You, just write to us at africa to you.vivian at gmail.com. Again, it's africa to you.vivian at gmail.com. Thank you for watching Africa to You. Till next time. Mm -hmm.